I'm sitting here in the Hard Drive Radio Video Studios with one of my favorite people. And, uh, uh, we've known each other a really long time. Sully Erna is here. Thank you. Yeah, we've definitely known each other a long time. <laughs> you know, I was thinking the other day that first time I ever met you was, you know, when your previous label you know, rented a Winnebago. And we all drove to New Haven and oh, you guys yeah. were playing Toad's Place. That was a lo- wow. That was a long time ago. Yeah. I forgot that was even you. That was me. That was a long time ago. I was the good only, memory. I was the only non-label person, actually, that was invited. Wow, good memory. Mm-hmm. You're like Penny Lane. <laughs> That's funny. Well, congratulations on this, your second album, Hometown Life. Um, you know, I was thinking, looking back on that Avalon experience, which was very unique and, and, and so different from anything you had ever done, um, how was that experience for you, and kind of what did you take away from that that you know brought you to hometown life? Um, well, I mean, obviously, it was my first real departure from Godsmack, so I think everyone kind of took a step back, the fans, the audience, and was just like, "Whoa!" Because I'm assuming they must have assumed that that I was going to do a solo rock record, you know, and put together like a super group or whatever. So I think when they first heard Avalon, it was just a, a real shock to everybody. Why is he playing piano and I'm hearing cellos and what's going on here, you know? But I also think they were semi-prepared for that too because even Godsmack's catalog has always had certain songs like Voodoo or Serenity that kind of taken us down that road. And and Avalon was just, uh, uh, you know, grabbing those, those melodies and that kind of uh, style of music and taking it even further down the rabbit hole. <clears throat> so when I was writing for the new record, Hometown Life, you know, I was just thinking, what what do I what do I want to do that's different from Avalon now? Because I liked that it surprised people. I liked that they it was the unexpected, um, and so, uh, you know, I thought, man, how do I take another left hand turn now so we don't sound like Avalon every time? Um, that's why I was a little lighter using Lisa Geyer on this album, although I used the same musicians. Um, Irina Chakova played cello for me on this, and Chris Lester, Tim Terrio, uh, David Stefanelli, um, Chris Decato. Um, Lisa, we just went a little bit lighter on because, you know, I, I wanted to make sure I wasn't marrying myself to that sound either, and then if people would expect me every time to have a strong female voice with me. Um, so this, you know, this was just for me, Avalon was more about, it was more earthy, it was more tribal. You know, it was more hypnotic, um, where this was a little bit more cleaner production-wise, um, like, a, like a masculine Adele would be, you know, just like piano, strings, um, just real clean songwriting. For me, it was more about the songs. It wasn't so much about the vibe. It was about just writing good songs. And so I think that's the difference between Avalon and this, is this is just a little bit more... Uh, everywhere it's it's multi genre you know there's some adult contemporary on there there's some jazzy blues kind of stuff there's some songs that have a little hint of country in it um you know so um where where avalon was just a little bit more down that world music kind of vibe and i think i mean correct me if i'm wrong but i i kind of think that these songs are a little more personal i mean they're they're a little more of your heart opening up i think than than where it was on avalon yeah, for sure. Um, you know, Avalon had a couple that um, left me a bit exposed. Broken Road certainly being one of them. Uh, my Light being about my daughter, you know, and a, and a father's promise to his daughter to never leave her and that kind of thing. But yeah, you're right. You know, this one was, um, some of the stuff was a bit left over from uh, Avalon. Um, so some of the songs have a little bit more age to them, like Forever My Infinity is one of them that me and Lisa were working on shortly after we finished Avalon. But um, a lot of the other stuff is fairly new or stuff that I've written along the way since Avalon was released. Um, and so, you know, a lot of things happen in six years. And, you know, uh, the, some of these songs just... Uh, left me a bit vulnerable, you know, because I don't really write about make-believe stories, scripted stuff. It's always based on something in my life, an event in my life that affected me emotionally. Um, That's where I feel I get my truest, um, you know, lyrical content from. Um, And this music felt really honest, and I felt it deserved that. So I went more down that road to just, uh, you know, share with the world 
um, every little heart string that would you know that that that, that tugged on me. So that's that's that. How how long after the Avalon cycle finished did you kind of have an idea that you were going to do another solo record? I, I didn't. You know, I never even knew I was going to do Avalon. It was just over the years I play music, and so some songs I write. I know they're not quite right for Godsmack, you know, even on a lighter sense. You know, I know Godsmack's done some acoustic things, but some songs are even more further away from that. They just wouldn't fit. But I just think they're beautiful songs still. So I put them on the back burner. And when I find some time, uh, you know, uh, for, away from Godsmack, um, I record. And so Avalon was a very personal record. And so isn't this one. And I've now identified that the solo music is just that. It's There's no time limit on it. There's no timeline on it. Um, I'm not under any kind of stress or con contractual obligations. I'm just writing music that I also enjoy writing. Um, and I release it when I have enough that I feel a strong enough to make a record. And I think that's how I'll always continue to do solo music. I don't think I'm ever going to put the pressure on me um, like now I know bands like Godsmack have, um, you know, when you get to a certain level and then they're expected to put out a record every so often. This isn't what, the, as a, that's not what this is about for me. This is just about me and um, I'm not looking for critics. I'm not looking, I, it doesn't matter. You know, I, I would love my fans to love this stuff and I hope that people enjoy it. I hope there's a new audience that comes along with it, but I certainly don't write to please people with the solo stuff. I, I just write because this is a whole other side of me that I really enjoy playing and performing. And, you know, I, it, it, what, what's also cool is the fact that, you know, the other guys in Godsmack also, you know, kind of feel the same. They have another side of, of their, you know, musical capabilities that they want to explore. And, of course, they did with the, you know, Apocalypse Blues Review yeah. and uh, with another animal, you yep. know, in the past. So, you know, it's good that you guys, you know, have that, I think, because I, I, I always think, like, when I talk to people like Corey Taylor, you know, like taking things from the experience of one thing, not that you bring it to the other, but it, it sort of makes you look at things differently, maybe appreciate things a little differently. And and expand, you know. I mean, I, I take things from these musicians that I work with in the solo project who are these phenomenal multi-instrumentalists and can play so much better than I can as a musician, you know. I'm a, I'm a, I've learned over the years that it's not that I'm some phenomenal musician, you know. Drums, I definitely have dialed in more than any other instrument because I... I played drums the longest and I, I had proper training when I was younger. Um, but as far as guitar or harmonica or piano or vocals, um, I, I found that I'm just more of a composer. I'm a good arranger. I'm a good producer. And so I hear the melodies. I know how to put the pieces together. But sometimes I'll hear stuff that's even more complex and I'll lean on these kind of guys because they're great musicians. And so I think that's what it is for me is that I can share any kind of vision with them and they can not only execute it, but bring the authenticity of that specific genre that that song is about to the music. Um, and so, you know, it's to me, it's about learning and expanding. You know, it's about using people like that to learn more about. And, and then when I go back to Godsmack, I'm able to bring new ideas, new melodies. Now I know I can go to this note instead of that note when someone's in this key. And because I've learned that through working with classical trained musicians and cellists and all these other textures and colors I put into the solo stuff. Um, touring behind this, I guess, is going to be a little different than you had with Avalon. With Avalon, you had, what, it's like a 15-piece orchestra, <laughs> like when you look eight. back. It was it eight. It, feel, mm -hmm. it felt so much bigger. <laughs> <laughs> it sounded huge. Yes, it did. Um, so what will it be like on this run? I think it's just you and another guy, right? No, it's me and two of my guitar players. Uh, Chris Lester and Tim Terry are going to join me. Um, we're going to do uh, a couple of shows out in Eastern Europe and Bulgaria, and we're going to use some live strings out there. Um, but when we get to the States, we're just going to kind of keep it me and a couple of guys. And we're going to bring this as a very more stripped down, intimate version of what the record is. Um, although some songs on the record have that more intimate, stripped down feel anyways. It's just a piano and a vocal or an acoustic and a, and a cello. Um, but we want I wanted to do that because, again, I wanted to display the songwriting on this record and not so much um, a big you know, a big production, you know. Um, you collaborated um, 
with uh, Zach Beloy on a couple of these songs. Can you tell us about them? Yeah, well, I um, I was reaching out to some some uh, musicians and my management team and just kind of asking around on uh, who who would be interested in doing some collaborations. Um, I, I've always thought there was a, just an amazing group of uh, Nashville writers um, that I just think do a tremendous job with with hooks and melodies. And um, there's one one gentleman in particular, his name is J.T. Harding. I'm going to get him at some point because, uh, you know, we've become really good friends and I really respect him as a songwriter. Um, and there's another gentleman, Zach Malloy, that, uh, that, that we were able to contact and he was available and was into coming up to New Hampshire to meet and do some writing with me. And so we sat around for a day or two and it was really cool. He was a great guy and uh, came up with a couple of really strong songs for the record, some of my favorite ones. Um, there's a song called Your Own Drum and uh, another one called Different Kind of Tears, um, which was the first or second um, track that we released as a pre-order kind of thing. Um, and yeah, he's, you know, he's just one of those Nashville guys that, that just has a great head for melody and arrangements and stuff like that. And he really brought something different and almost had a little bit of that country flair to it, but yet in a commercial very modern kind of way so it's not country but it just you know you can hear there's a little hint of it in there um and it worked for some reason you know um and he really seen my vision he's seen what i was trying to do as a solo artist and and trying to figure out where if there was a lane there for me because everybody knows me as this big hard rock singer from godsmack um but he was like you know i think there's a lane now because of artists that came out like james bay and chris stapleton's doing so well and and so I was like, yeah, that's exactly right. So, you know, it was really, really fun to work with him. And I would certainly, you know, be up for working with him again. It's funny how I was just thinking, you know, that, that, that you know, some of the country, right, you know, people that write for country and then, you know, how people like, you know, Aaron Lewis and, and Steven Tyler, you know, kind of got into like wanting to, oh, yeah. you know, get into that genre. Dip their toe in there. Yeah, it's kind of, kind of blows my mind, actually. Um. So with with a couple of those songs, um, you know, let, let's talk about. Um, well, first of all, your dad <sighs> makes an appearance on a song called "Turn It Up," and uh, if anyone has seen your webisodes, uh, you know they can actually see your dad and uh, see you interact with him. And I thought you were picking on him a little too much, <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> talk about working with your father. That's all right. He had he had his share of picking on me his my whole life, so yeah. It's good for a little payback once in a while. No, you know, it's, it's, it was cool. It was, um, you know, I, I started music when I was three and a half years old, and it was because my dad's a musician. He's a trumpet player. He still owns and, uh, and conducts the Northeast Italian band that does all the Italian feasts throughout New England, you know, when they carry the saints in and pin money up on them, and there's the marching band that follows them, plays all the Italian stuff. and That's him, you know, so... And it was because of his bands in the basement and me watching them play and falling asleep in the acoustic guitar cases and all that, being a little kid, that I got into music. So all these decades later, it's really nice to actually had come up with a song. And it wasn't, uh, I didn't write it for this reason, but I, as one of these songs developed, um, it ended up being this kind of swanky, funky, jazzy blues song. And I knew, you know what, I'm not going to use strings on this, I'm going to use horns. And then I just still didn't think of them. I was just looking for a horn section and picking out some musicians to record with. But as I was doing that, I'm thinking, why wouldn't I use my, this, my dad's a trumpet player, like, you know? So I'm gonna get the old man in here, and he's, you know, 71 now, he's about to turn 72. And, um, you know, I brought him the song, and he was really excited and nervous, and it was funny, because he hadn't played in 15 years. Um, so I'd go over the house, and, you know, and, and my stepmom, uh, you know, Zoila, She'd be like, he's in the bedroom practicing. And, you know, I'd go in there and sneak the door open. And there he is just trying to, you know, I walked in at one point. It was actually funny. He's shaking the trumpet like this and looking at it. And I opened the door and I'm like, what are you doing? He goes, I don't know. You know, I'm trying to get something out of this fucking thing. And I'm keep blowing in it and nothing's coming out. And I'm like, you're not going to get any sound out of it by shaking it. You're going to, he's like, I haven't played in a long time. My lip's gone and, you know, whatever. So he's a trip, man. He's just an old school Sicilian, you know guy that uh is just set in his ways and but he's funny he's a funny dude and uh you know we have this great relationship now so it was really nice to have the opportunity after all these all these years a whole lifetime 
um, to actually have him not only record on my record, but to, to I played a live show with him at Mohegan Sun in Connecticut. Um, and we put him front and center and introduced him and the crowd went crazy. And it was really cool. It was a great moment. And, you know, I'll, I'll always have that with me forever. So did you pay him scale or what? Yeah, I did. I sent him a check. He called me. He goes, I don't know what he's sending me money for. I'm like, yeah, you know, you get paid like everyone else. He couldn't believe it. He probably didn't even cash it. He just probably, you know, thumbtacked it up on his cork board. <laughs> so. I love it. I love it. So talk about the concept, I guess, behind this. I mean, hometown life. Uh, you wrote it at home in New Hampshire in your home studio. I wrote hometown life everywhere. You know, hometown life is just, uh, it's an album based on, music that is about my entire life you know especially the song hometown life the title track is really about just me reflecting back on where i came from and how i became the man that i am today through all these experiences that i've gone through from a place that i thought for sure i would have ended up dead or in jail so um you know but but the 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 catalog of music that's in the cd is really um, just a reflection of every everything that I do in my life, everywhere I go, everything that I am, because it's all it's all um, from where I came from, you know. So it's like it's, it's like it's just it's it's kind of like the nucleus of everything, you know. And and uh, Lawrence, Massachusetts, was just one of those places that if it wasn't for that place, I don't know if it would have shaped and molded me to become who I am today, so I could fight and survive and do the things I had to do over the years to even become successful. So it's a little bit of everything, I think. Uh, your own drum. Uh, was that a song that you sort of wrote to uh, your daughter, Skylar? I, I didn't, I didn't write your own drum to my daughter, but I certainly drew some influence. Me and Zach actually sat and talked about this. Um, that and different kind of tears were kind of drawn. We were talking about with dads now, and we're at the stage where, I, where our kids are teenagers, and it's very challenging years, FYI. If you're a parent and are dealing with a teenage girl, especially as a dad, whoo, it's fun. Um, but, you know, I was looking at that whole thing, and, you know, the things that you want to tell them the most is like they get so influenced at such an early this stage, especially like high school years, you know, just starting high school, this is when you can, they'll either carve out the right path or they could easily go down the wrong path. Um, and ultimately I think the message is just, you know, be a leader and not a follower. Like, you know, run to the beat of your own drum, like make sure that you're doing you and not just following in everyone's footsteps and doing what they want you to do and being, uh, you know, in influenced in the wrong ways and stuff like that. You know, and same thing with different kind of tears. It's, it's a song that, is more um, thinking about people like my daughter where they go through their first heartbreak, you know, and that pain is so deep for them and they think nobody can understand. You don't get it, Dad. You don't understand. And we so understand because we've been through it so many times. But as adults, we know when it happens, it still sucks. But we know what we got to do now and it's going to just take some time and it'll heal eventually and, you know, whatever. Where they're just like the world tips upside down and it's all that. And so they're different kind of tears for them. It's a deeper kind of pain, you know, and, and stuff that they don't think anyone else understands. So both those songs, I think, you know, the inspiration was drawn from people like my daughter and, you know, teenagers in general. It's funny, you know, Head was in here from Corn and, um, you know, his, his promoting his book. <clears throat> and, you know, he, he had a very similar situation with his daughter because she got into drugs and, you know, there was a whole thing that happened and uh, it, it, you know, you can understand your frustrations, you know, yeah. and, 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 and as parents, you know, we, we look at it through the eyes of a child, right? So we're feeling their pain and almost feeling helpless because you can't do much, you know, you just, you, and it's hard to break it down and explain it to them. Cause when you're in that kind of pain, you don't want to hear it from anybody. You just want it to go away or you want it to be fixed or you immediately want to work things out. Um, and so it's frustrating as for a parent too, you know? And uh, we're even working on a concept for the video for that, to be able to see it more through the parents' eyes and what we deal with as parents to try to, hope, to help them or to want to help them, but, but being helpless at the same time. 
You did a cool uh, lyric video, by the way, for that tune already. It, were those? I, I'm oh, assuming. Yeah. I'm assuming that those are you. you yeah. Did the writing? Yeah, I, I did that. You did too. Yeah, I just did that in my living room. I set up a little camera and I just kind of threw something out there for fun. I think it turned out really well. Yeah, it was cool. Right. Yeah. That was my first attempt at editing a video myself. Now that I have a uh, final cut, whatever it's called. <laughs> He'll tell you. Yeah, I like All you, you tech guys. To yeah, I, I like that you tried to make it look old, you know, with like the lines that went through yeah, and stuff. Yeah, because they have built-in little yeah. effects now, and it's just great. It was cool. Now I can see how little you guys actually work. <laughs> so the pay's going to go way down. Uh, that's so funny. That's so funny. Um, what are some of your favorite tunes on this record uh, that maybe we haven't talked about yet? Uh, I really like... Um, I like different songs for different reasons, you know. I really like Blue Skies. I think it's a, you know, really beautiful piano composition um, that, I don't know, what, the first time I wrote it, just the music alone, I didn't even have words for it yet. It just sounded so beautiful to me. So I love that one. Um, but I also love Don't Comfort Me, um, although it's the, it's, to me it's the heaviest emotional song on the record for me. And it's going to be the most challenging one for me to do live, I think, because that is something that's, you know, that I went through more recently versus some of the songs that have a little bit of date to them. Um, but I like, you know, I like, I like Take All of Me because it has this cool kind of salsa bossa nova feel to it. Um, you know, there's, there's a, there's just every, every song on this record is very different from the next one. That's what I love about the record. So I don't know if I have any favorite favorites, but, you know, certainly um, different kind of tears and Don't Comfort Me would be in the top top three for me and you you guys took a little more time making well you uh, took a little more time uh, i think with strings and whatnot on, the, on this record too right there are a couple of two three songs where you've got some really beautiful string arrangements yeah there's probably even more than that but um yeah there was uh you know whenever i write this kind of music i again i, I it feels very orchestrated to me and so i always hear you know violins and cellos and stuff like that um, and I, again, I had the opportunity to work with my favorite cellist in the whole world, which is Irina Chikova. And, um, and I'm about to go play her country and she's not going to be with me. And I'm really bummed out about that, but you know, we'll go back there and for sure we'll take her, but she's under contract with Celine Dion now and things like that. But, um, but yeah, I, I love strings. I love cellos. I love violins. I love all that stuff. And, uh, if it calls for it, I put it in some ones don't come for me as a French horn in there. So that's a different instrument I've never worked with before. And uh, and then, of course, there's a bigger horn section for Turn It Up, which is the song my dad was on. So, And then some stuff's just pretty much naked, you know, with percussion and things like that with your own drum. So there's a pretty good variety of things on this record to listen for. So you're going to tour behind this? Yeah, I'm going to go out and um, do a couple of dates on the eastern side of Europe, and then I'm coming back and going to start the States on October 26th. Uh, that'll take me until about the day after Thanksgiving. And then, uh, obviously, we'll break for the holidays, and I'll start up again the beginning of the year, in February or March or something like that, and do the West Coast and some of the other side. And then what's next for Godsmack? I don't know yet. You know, we're talking now about getting together maybe fall of next year to write and record and dropping something top of 2018, uh, which is going to be the 20th year anniversary of our first album. So we thought, you know what, we could have pushed it and did something to drop in 2017. But we were like, you know what, let's just, every, they're working on their side project and I'm working on the solo stuff. So we're like, let's just finish this and do it right and just wait a pinch longer. Because if we do that and we drop in 2018, we can make a really big, great world tour with, uh, you know, the whole theme of the first album concepts involved in it and all that. So I think that may be the plan. But You know, thinking back in the early days of Godsmack, remind me, wasn't, was Paul Geary your original drummer? No, no. Paul Geary was our original manager. All right. Why did I want to say that I thought he was drumming for you? For he a drummed for Extreme. Well, I knew that. Yeah. I knew that, but I, I don't know why I no. wanted to get that in my head. No, no. Tommy Stewart was our original drummer. Tommy. Tommy the Baldy. Whatever happened to him? I don't know. Oh. I know he's married, and I think he has a kid or two now. Um, but I don't know. I don't know. Oh. Last I heard, he was with uh, Low Pro, and that was a while ago. Right. So that, I don't know. Yeah, that was a while. He played ago. with Fuel for a little bit, I think. Yeah. Um, looking back at 20 years of Godsmack, 
Um, what are a couple of highlights for you? 20 years of Godsmack. Um, well, certainly for my musician side of me, I think it's meeting some of the people that were my childhood heroes, you know, being able to meet Neil Peart a couple of times, that was for me, you know, I didn't need to meet anyone else after that. As much as I love the Steven Tyler's and the Joe Perry's and the James Hetfield's, you know, Neil Peart, it, that guy changed my life as a musician. You know, I quit school because of Rush. The only time I went back to school is because I needed to steal the wood blocks because I was learning the trees in Xanadu and there was a wood block part and I didn't have wood blocks. So I went back to school and I robbed the band music room and wrapped them in a blanket and walked down Lauren Street and got the wood blocks and learned the part. Um, other than that, you know, it was like, really, that's all I did is I studied Rush. You know, I sat home and strapped on headphones and played moving pictures and exit stage left and signals and all these great albums, you know. Um, so I think meeting some of those guys, you know, Neil Peart, Ozzy, um, James Hetfield, Steven Tyler, Joe Perry, you know, all, all those childhood heroes of mine, that was certainly, you know, great memories in the 20 years that I've been on the road, um, you know, being able to sing Heaven and Hell with Black Sabbath, things like that, those and Sad But True with, with Metallica, those are big moments, you know, when you grow up listening to bands like those and, and listening to those songs and then you're there at that level actually playing with them, you know. Not that we're at their level, but, you know, but when you get to tour with them and things like that and you're on that same stage, it's pretty cool. I just recently got to uh, hang with Dave Grohl and sing... Uh, School's Out by Alice Cooper uh, at Fenway Park in Boston. So that was pretty pretty big deal for me, too. And what a great bunch of guys those guys are. So, yeah, if I would have to look at highlights of my last 20 years, I would definitely single those moments out more than, you know, the parties and the girls and that kind of thing. Who hasn't told that story? And who cares anymore? <laughs> Exactly. You know, when you held up your arm, I remembered your ACDC uh, tattoo there. Boom. Um, and I didn't even get to see Brian Johnson. Well, I have in the past, but I wanted to see this last tour. And just as I was thinking I was going to get to one of these shows, he, he went down and retired. And I'm like, ah, oh, I'm not going to see Axel, so I'm good. I know. That's what I wanted to get your opinion on, on, on you know, what, what did you think of that? Because I don't even know if Brian is really retired, as it were. Oh, good. That would be great. I I mean, I think, you know, people ask us all the time, they're like, who, you know, if, who else would you go out with? Who would you tour with? Who would you open for? And I'm thinking, I'm thinking, I'm thinking, I'm thinking, I'm like, there's not too many bands left that I would really want to open for. Cause you know, I really like Godsmack being a headlining band, but you know, there's some bands we've learned not to go on after like the Foo Fighters or Rage Against the Machine. Because they're destructive up there and just forget it. Like when they get done on a stage, there's just remnants of nothing. You don't want to, you do not want to be in that stage. So you go on before them. That's a fact. But I think that, you know, ACDC is probably one of the last bands that if we had a choice to go out and support a band, like I think that would be the band, you know, because we've already done Sabbath and we've done Metallica and we've done some, you know, some really great, some really great bands. But um, ACDC would be, that would be a good tour. But I don't know, you know, if that's a if that's a death wish or if it's just a, you know, a fantasy because I hear that the guitar tech when he comes out and puts Angus's guitar on the stand gets a bigger applause than the opening bands do. <laughs> so, that's a tough one, you know. Here's an idea though, because, you know, as as we know, some of your band members live in the, you know, this Florida area, but uh you should get Brian to sing a song on the next ACDC, right? I mean, on the next uh, Godsmack. Oh, album. man, that would be amazing. That would be amazing. I think I, it could be done. I hope he can come back. I mean, he can. He he did a record. He did some songs with um oh, Jim Brewer. Oh, he already sang. All right, cool. I didn't know that. I haven't been following up on it. Yeah. You know, I know our our monitor guy that usually does us when he's not with ACDC does ACDC. That's Brian's main guy. So I just I got a call actually at one point. He was like, "You you want to come in to audition?" I'm like, "I can't sing ACDC." Are you kidding me? Well, we thank you so much of course, for taking thank time you. And, and coming by today. And uh, good luck with everything. And good luck with your uh, other project you had mentioned. We don't have to talk about it here. but uh, Yeah, thanks. Yeah, of course. Thanks. Thanks for always having me. I mean, you've been an amazing supporter since day one. So it's really nice to have people like you still on board with us. Because without people like you, 
you know, we wouldn't get the publicity and the press that we get. So thanks for always supporting us and rock music and music in general and being a music, avid music lover. We love you too. Thank you. You're welcome. And then right when I said that in my head, Dave Grohl walked through the door and I was like, Matrix. whoa, just, I was like, well, this is weird. There's a little room. It was probably not even much bigger than this room right here. And he just, I kind of didn't say much because I was kind of, I was a little nervous. To tell you. Because we love to play, but when you hear our first string of dates announced, you'll understand why that is, because we're not going to be playing in, in uh, an environment that you would expect us to be playing in.